So yesterday we saw that uh, the friend from the village made a very important uh, suggestion that if you want photon to feel gravity, the only way it could feel is that the gravity must cover the space. And space and time we have already bound together to the universal velocity. So the, the gravity must cover space-time because space is no longer independent of itself. Space is bound with the time. So it's a space it should bound that uh, <coughs> that gravity must be described by curving the space time. It's a curvature of space time. This view must realize <coughs> is a very revolutionary step. Because so far, no other force in nature had made such a demand on the space-time. Space-time was inert background given to you. Physics did not interact with space-time. No law came. So first time you came to the, so you came to this conclusion that no, the space <coughs> space time has to describe the dynamics of a, a force. You see the step first equation here, and all this is going from where? All this is caused from the, the consist thing. Where is the joke here? Yeah. yeah. Could we get some more white salt jokes on that? Not today, but only. Okay. Mm -hmm. no. And that all this follows from this one concept. It was a So first say, you had your good old space and time, absolute in Newton's sense, but they could not maintain their absoluteness, the moment we realized that there must exist in nature a universal velocity, velocity which is constant for all of us. So existence of <coughs> universal velocity <coughs> demanded that we come from space and time to space time. <clears throat> and this universal velocity, as, as we saw yesterday, was actually a cons consequence of universality of of space and time. That the space and time are the two universal entities. And since they are universal, they cannot be independent. They must be connected through a universal relation. And that is that. See. So it, so that's, so, th so that is, so first time, what was considered to be a, a given background was first asked that, no, you were hard a given background, all right, but you are not independent. 
you have to do have to be bound. <coughs> That's the direct one. Then question came about was so this again today this was the other thing was then we wanted to consider the universality of gravity. That the gravity is a universal force. Now this by universality what we really mean is for any given force, there are two characteristics which, which characterize a force. One is its linkage. What does it link to? Or to say, who does it affect? Now we say that universal force means this linkage is universal, which means it it links to everything. Now that all things which are this, we can classify in two categories. The ones which have mass, non-zero, the ones which do not have mass, mass is zero. So you have the particles, so you have a zero mass particles and non-zero mass particles. And universality we, by mean that it should affect, it should link to both zero mass as well as the non-zero mass. Newtonian gravity linked only to the non-zero mass. So here the question is that you want to, so what you have to do, to universalize gravity, or the gravity being a universal force, means it must link to the zero mass particle, and it is linking to zero mass particle is possible as our friend from the village told us is only if space is curved because the zero mass particle can experience no acceleration it doesn't feel gratified to for it for anything to feel gratified it ought to have a non-zero mass. So the space must be cut. <coughs> <coughs> and then as I said earlier, space is not complete in itself. So the space time must be so the graph so that's the first break we have that the space time as to be. So now, before we go, just, just a one little thing to go ahead. That here, that universality of the velocity bound space and time together, and if you follow, you will get a me new mechanics of relate Einstein's special relativity. And of course, special relativity, <coughs> well, you have this beautiful picture everywhere and you can't do without uh, it to talk about special relativity. So you have your light cone. The regions lying inside, any two points you take there, they have a causal connection. So this is the, your absolute past, this is the absolute future. Things lying outside have no chronology. 
I cannot say the past or future. <coughs> you. And the line of causality is defined by the velocity of light. <coughs> The null curve, null or that is the light line, defines the line of causality. Things lying inside, left orbits are all, or left right will depend on which one you take that. So all these are. So this is the the present event. Everything else, past, past, the future. So. Even slime here, they could be all causally connected. Even slime outside. So in our technical language, we say the even slime in, inside the causally connected, they have a time-like interval, which, uh, <coughs> which, which really means that there can <coughs> You can choose an observer for which both the events occur at the same position. Or that is that is to say, you can travel with the things lying outside are the space life where you cannot uh, say about their future and present. You and the <coughs> the causal, causal case. So this you do this. What else does it do? It also does relates energy, momentum, and mass through a quadratic relation. And you all know that like a good self-respecting relativist, I don't carry on C anymore alone. So C is one. So this now the one point about this I would like to say that this is a quadratic relation. So now let's say where do you realize this quadratic nature? A photon has a zero mass. For photon it will be m equal to zero, so e square equal to p square. Now let us consider two photons. Consider a system of two photons. Will their mass of two together be zero or non zero? Uh, Any quick guess? Each photon has a zero mass, but the two together would be must <laughs> mass be zero or non zero. What is the mass of two particle system? Huh? What is the mass of two particle system? Sorry, mass of? What is the mass of two particle system? What, 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 what the question means? I mean, you ask for mass no, of two particles. Yeah, two photons, not what? Well, the, 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 the particles are photons. Yeah, but what? But, but what, is it? what is the mass of two photons? So right. I don't get it. Can you get it? Yeah. I know what the mass of one photon is. What, what is like the mass of two photons? What is just the reason I consider massless uh, uh, enclosed and I put two photons inside that? Ah, so they are not interacting or anything. You are assuming they are completely. Oh, yeah, they are not interacting. Huh? There is zero, right? No. No. 
That's right. Uh, uh, if it was zero, then I won't ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do so. That's you know, that, that brings out that, that this relation is a quadratic relation. So, so for example, you have two photons. One energy E1, momentum P1. Another that P1. Energy E2 and momentum P2, right? And this is true that E1 squared equal to P1 squared, E2 squared equal to P2 squared, right? Now, two together, so I will have the energy as E equal to E1 plus E2, and momentum as <coughs> P1 plus P2. Now evaluate this thing. So you have an E1 plus E2 square minus P1 plus P2 square. And see, is it, is it always zero? <coughs> and you will say, no, it will be zero only if P1 is parallel to P2. So if there are two photons parallelly propagating, then yes. But if the photons are not parallelly propagating, they will have a non-zero mass. As a matter of fact, this fact, the most of you know this thing, and uh, some, again, very confusing terminology gets adopted. Though initially there was the right terminology being used. How do you just characterize this equation of state? Perhaps people doing cosmology probably do every day or anything. Rho, rho equal to 3p. And what you, why do you say it? You call this your radiation. Right? Radiation, of course, propagates with velocity of light. Right? Then, its, it's mass must be zero. And what do you call about the mass? Is it something like rho plus 3 p the mass? And this is not this. So, what is this fluid called rho equal to 3 p? It tells you that its constituents are the photons. But these photons are, so, that the first term being used for this equation of zero, the right term which, was, which unfortunately we forgot about and gave to this, because this is easier, radiation, you know. This is the incoherent in null fluid which tells you these are photons which have a random mass that random direction of them. so incoherent they are incoherent and incoherent photons are is like any other fluid which has a rest mass. So I get the matter of fact, this is the, the, the clear application of this fact that the two photons put together. Here we have a cloud of photons put together and they, are, they, are, they behave like a, that system behaves like a fl fluid with the density rho and pressure p with the equation of state rho equal to 3p. 
but it, it would have been more convenient to carry on with the, the original description of this. Incorrect photon fluid is the right, right description for such a fluid. <laughs> so, the special relativity, so this gets you to, to merge these three quantities which are distinct in the Newtonian framework into two, because there is this uh, one relation you have. Here, uh, now even at the risk of being misunderstood and, uh, but yet this damn thing is so very nice intuitively in a practical sense. And that is to say, the time flows with the velocity of light. That defining the causality, when I say that your light is the, defines the line of causality, which should actually also mean that should define the timeline. Because the causality is defined by time, when, by asking what precedes and what doesn't precede. So now, you cannot say that time by itself can I prescribe a velocity to it. I can't. Consumption, no. But to keep ourselves to understand this thing in a rough intuitive way is one can consider that time, time's velocity is, is that of this universal velocity. So I think better, maybe I should modify myself to say light is a one particular identification of universal velocity. So let us say there is a universal velocity. And that, so the time flows with this universal velocity which is universally constant for everybody. And that is precisely why that you cannot cast time or you cannot go faster than time to, to uh, see backward. Right? But I said, here I am risking myself uh, for a, a confusion or a misunderstanding, but uh, I do it because this, other, this is just intuitively a very, uh, is a very illuminating thing. Okay, so once we have, so one, so the one other question, uh, another general principle I could describe that we can come from the Newtonian world to the Einstein world by the principle of universalization. So universalization is a physical rising principle. So what we are doing, you have the Newtonian mechanics to universalize, to bring in the zero mass particle, you come to special relativity. Similarly, so you, you universalize gravity, again to bring in the zero mass particle, you come to general relativity. Now in this process of universalization, you are in both these cases, what we have done? <coughs> As a matter of fact, we have not added anything new to ourselves. What really we have done is, we have <coughs> enlarged the framework.
for special relativity, universalization of the mechanics, enlargement of the framework. We did not include, did not invoke anything new. I had these two quantities, entities called space and time. I bound them together. So enlargement of the framework came through <coughs> the uh, synthesizing space and time. Of course, in that synthesis, we need required a new realization that the realization of the existence of a universal velocity. Now we are saying that, okay, I want to universalize gravity. Similarly, we ask the question that we don't uh, <coughs> add, don't add anything. We enlarge the existing framework. How do we enlarge the range of framework? That's so I have a space time bound together by through the uh, universal velocity. I know <coughs> so there I bound space on together. I now have a space time. What can else what else can I do about it? So one natural question comes about is, okay, it is flat, you can curve it. And see if we, <coughs> what happens when we curve it. Our, the friend from the village said, if you curve it, it will include gravity. So let us see whether that, that really happens. So that's the key question number one. So what we so we enlarge the framework from that is to curve space time. Hmm? <coughs> and that should give us <coughs> that the uh, uh, <coughs> how that you can so, so let's add, let, let's do this exercise once again. What we we said, uh, the free space time that we have talked earlier is a homogeneous space time, right? Which meaning the space homo and isotropic and time home. <coughs> <coughs> this we mean by that. In all these lecture lectures I would like to see we will not Try to put any, add anything by hand. We will see how, what the logic of the thing or what the geometry demands, and that is all what we will follow. So now you say that okay, I am a homogeneous space time. What should be its geometry? Of course, one obvious answer will be, since it is free and homogeneous and free of all forces, it should be flat. Let's see, is that the only answer? Is that the most general answer for the space time to be flat? <coughs> so, so, the geometry, so you will also demand that means the space time is homogeneous, the geometry must also be homogeneous. So 
stands to reason. What characterizes the ge geometry? The curvature. That is your demon tensor. This must be homogeneous. What does that mean? That means the Riemann curvature must be constant. But constant relative to what? You have to keep in mind that I have to define a derivative which takes into account that its space is curved. So it shall be constant relative to the covariant derivative. Well, that is the covariant derivative of uh, Riemann curvature must vanish. Right? So let's find the solution for this. What is the solution? Well, this, I'm saying that you see, I'm mathematically challenged, but you <coughs> can't do any integration. Only I want to get, get around the tricky things by asking some simple questions and try to see that, yes, that gives me answer. Or not. So I would ask the question other way around. What is, what is it? that is constant relative to covariant derivative. If I know that quantity, then I should be, a, if I write the Riemann tensor in terms of that, the Riemann tensor will be constant. So, some of you have done some GR. So what is it which is constant relative to covariant derivative? Okay. <coughs> Metric. So yeah. So it is the metric. So you write now. So you now write that. Write the tensors in terms of the metric. You want something constant, so put it that some constant here. And respecting the symmetric property of the Riemann tensor, you will have this combination. where lambda is, is constant. Lambda is, why lambda is needed? Lambda is needed to match the dimension. Because that metric is dimensionless. Riemann curvature is involved the second derivative of the metric. So its dimension is one over length square. So I need a constant and give that a dimension of one over length square. So, I have <coughs> so the homogeneous space time, which is free of all forces, all dynamics, is not necessarily a flat space, but a space time of constant curvature. We do not know what that constant curvature is, whether it is positive, negative, or zero. That we ought to leave for the observation to decide, or experiment to decide. So we have space time of constant curvature and not of zero curvature. So if you, you have a now, <coughs> this lambda got called in literature cosmological constant. C 
simply because it was introduced in a funny Enoch manner, not, not through such a pristine argument, then it will be dark. Einstein wanted to, he said Einstein had his equations which were highly nonlinear thing and then he did have a difficulty to imagine to find the solutions of this. But Schwarzschild found the first solution is <coughs> describe an isolated particle. Then Einstein being always an ambitious man wanted to say, okay, why not build a model for the universe? And to solve your equation, you try to build the simplest model. And the simplest model, you say that the universe is static, and it is filled with only gas, dust, non iterating well, we all know that if you have a no, the dust particles all around, by their own gravity, they should all collapse. There needs some force to, to counteract the gravitational attraction. Now, where do you find something to happen? And then he just realized that, okay, you will come in later, eh? that this lambda shot in his equation, you can, without uh, lo loss of anything, or by free of cost, you can add this constant lambda GAP. And then this lambda provides you the counteracting force. So you could have a, a static model for the universe. And that is how that lambda would call the cosmological constant. It is for the for construction of the universe mm -hmm. model that lambda is required. Yes. But what what about the local sources? So this lambda tab should appear also in the local uh, Oh yeah, it would. Well, it will not, so here it will appear everywhere, but the physicists are always clever guys. So what, what you what you then want is the locally whatever the, the local scales you have relative to this lambda is so very small that it doesn't affect your local observation. So it becomes. Uh, relevant or pertinent only when the scale is global enough. <coughs> so you so local galaxy or the planetary system uh, this, this is a innocuous thing, you know. <coughs> so and then what he believed was as that there probably will exist no other solution of this question. So. But the Friedman, in 1922, obtained a non-static solution of, of uh, his equation, which of course you have an expanding universe. And for that expanding universe, you require no lambda. Because you could you could have a, a a cloud of dust particles expanding, and so lambda was not not necessary. So after the Friedman's discovery of the expanding inverse solution, oh of course you call it expanding or the contracting as you like it, what then you demand in the part. The lambda was not needed, and lambda remained in a limbo. Some people liked it, kept it, some people didn't like it, threw it out. 
But then it again gets revived in 1967. We will come to that. But this, but at the moment I want to keep this. However, this viewpoint has a direct conflict with what your textbook tells you. So what you are saying is, so let's say, no, this is visible or light or it is rather stick visible. So your the textbook view or which is unfortunately has to be called as the <coughs> conventional view. And on here what we say our uh, I would say that uh, when it comes to living thing, why not say? So let's say enlightened or right view or proper view of the thing. What you what you have here yeah, the textbook says absence of gravity. Human tensile is zero, space time is flat. What does this say? That human tensile is of constant curvature, which is your DDG. So it is of constant curvature, not necessarily of zero curvature. Zero curvature is admitted here. But <coughs> uh, no, here, and, I, and the space time is homogeneous. So here the homogeneous space time is a, has a non-zero curvature, a constant curvature. <coughs> that, uh, but you know here you have a very funny situation with the textbook thing. You admit that space time is homogeneous. Right? Oh, oh no, I, I don't know. So in the, yeah, in the, this way. So here, the space space time of constant curvature, you admit is homogeneous. It's maximally symmetric. All symmetries you have. Yet, according to the textbook view, it has a dynamics because Riemann curvature is non-zero because there you have said that it is the presence or absence of Riemann curvature that determines whether there is a gravity or no gravity. So you, you come here, you have a very <coughs> awkward situation in the textbook view that you have a homogeneous maximally symmetric space time which is which must be known which must be trivial gravitationally but in your their view it is not trivial because curvature is is non zero here so as the right way of looking at things would have been this so you will say this. In classical mechanics, what do you say? Absence of all space time is homogeneous. <coughs> Presence of all space time is inhomogeneous. Right? I should be able to do the same thing here. Can I do that or not? If I do that, then yes, I would insist that my viewpoint is the right sort of thing. So to that, that
So I have a the free stress time, free of all forces and dynamics, the space time is homogeneous. So that's all. Alright? You know, homogeneous means that the demand curvature is, is constant relative to cover in the <coughs> Now we say, so now the next part the question. What happens when it is on no Again, space time is in homogeneous. And the correct immediate thing you will say is that yes, if it is in homogeneous, then there should be some force present. This is an indication of a, some force. So, there should be some force here. What is the dynamics? It's a line. I know everything. I have to get everything from space time. It is inhomogeneous. Then the inhomogeneity of the space time should also give me the dynamics of this force. And the space time, of course, is a the basic thing, correct entity. Here you have the Riemann tensor. So you have to get the dynamics or equation of motion of force from the demand. How do we get it? So do we know? Again, nothing to add from outside. Does this, does differential geometry tell us something more about Riemann tensor? Now the differential geometry tells us one thing. It has a one very fundamental theorem that the d square is identical integral. A properly defined derivative, double derivative, identically vanishes. An exterior derivative. Huh? <coughs> exterior derivative. Yes, they are all exterior derivative. Yes. Uh, so that that should be zero. In phys other physical intuition we always have anything vanishing identically. We also try to associate. We also associate with some conservation conservation of some quantity. That it, it is a, could be a, some conservation law. And uh, John Wheeler famously called this as boundary of a boundary zero. Now, first let us try to look at the examples with, of this, which you are very much familiar with. But haven't looked them as d square zero, or haven't looked up in this context what Wheeler is telling us, boundary over boundary zero. So we all know this without bothering about it, what it is. Curl of a gradient is zero. Divergence, divergence of a curl is zero. All these are the examples of d square equal to zero. So you have a scalar field, you have a vector field, and this you will get. 
So these are the now if you go to a higher order you want to have a tensor field which would require space-time curvature for which this term then there you the so so this derivative this this could be called the Bianchi derivative which are the, what you say, anti symmetric derivatives. So you, so what it tells you is the Bianchi derivative of Riemann tensor must vanish. And that is demanded by the, the differential geometry. Another way of looking at saying is this, that when you say <coughs> curl of A vanishes, then you, what you conclude, you say A is a gradient of a scalar. Similarly, the Bianchi derivative of Riemann tensor vanishes, then it will tell you that Riemann tensor is written as an anti double curve. <coughs> so you have a, so this tells you that anti must be G. Now, this is given to us by differential geometry. It's a tensor relation. Again, in a very simple-minded manner, any tensor equation I have, without, free, free of cost, I can always contract it and see whether it makes a sense or not. So we say, Let's contract it. <coughs> you do all kinds of contraction, but there is only one contraction which will give you a non vacuous relation. And that contraction is gives you something what you are looking for that gives you a second rank symmetric tensor with vanishing divergence. So, 
again let me integrate it in my own simplistic manner without doing no integration, without doing any integration. And so I say, okay, I have a second link semantic tensor. Its divergence vanishes. So I can write, introduce a new tensor and demand that its divergence is zero. Plus, add something which is a constant relative to covariant derivative. Because when I take a divergence, and you said metric is the thing, and to keep the dimension right, lambda times the metric. So that's what you do. With a condition, This follows from differential geometry. We have not put anything from outside. We have not added anything. Now let's ask to say that I have this equation. Can I make a physical sense of it? Of course, the physical, all the thing what we wanted was we wanted the inhomogeneity of the sigma space time should give me an equation of motion for some force. Right? So we are looking for an equation of motion for some force. What does the equation of motion for a force involve? It's like del square phi. Del square phi equal to rho. The Newtonian equation of motion. So on the left hand side you require a second order differential operator having second derivative. On the right hand side you have the source which is the cause for the inhomogeneity. Huh? Now we, we have already seen that the distance of GAB is second order differential operator. Why? GAB comes from the Riemann tensor. It's Ricky, Ricky comes from Riemann. How? What is Riemann involved? Riemann involves the second derivative of the metric. So I have a second order differential operator, something like analog of the del square phi. On the right, I have this new quantity which I added. Only I demand that this quantity is conserved under covariant zero, that it is divergence is zero. So here, with the TAP, I, I, so I can identify some physical quantity which you would like to be conserved. That's one, but what should that quantity be? Now, <coughs> what did we start with? <coughs> that quantity, so first thing, this quantity, whatever it is, it should make space-time inhomogeneous universally. Means for all particles. That this should be some quantity, presence of which makes space-time inhomogeneous for all particles. Well, here I am saying is, if you put an electric charge, that makes space-time inhomogeneous only for the charged particles. Neutral particles, the space-time remains homogeneous. Here now we are saying, 
let know. This quantity TLB should be something which makes the uh, space-time inhomogeneous for all particles. Which means this should have some physical parameter, should be a measure of a physical parameter, which is universal. That is, anything physically exists has that parameter. Well, that is, it, it. so now say, what is that thing which is shared by everything which physically exists? What would you say? Energy point mass. Well, make it slightly general to energy momentum. But energy is fine enough. So everything everything which physically exists must have non-zero energy momentum. So then if you identify this with that energy momentum, lo and behold, so this is your, and TOB is your analog of you know. What did we get? This is an equation of motion for Einstein gravity. Did we ask for it? We were, we simply asked if there is no force, then the space time is homogeneous. Then we said, okay, if we, what happens when the space time is inhomogeneous? The answer came out that then it describes the Einstein gravity. So the equation of motion of gravity follows from the inhomogeneity of space time. And why that is happening? Simply because gravity is a universal force. And anything that causes it must be a universal physical parameter which is shared by everything that physically exists. And space-time is universal quantity. So it curves the space-time for universally for all particles. Okay, <coughs> so here we have it and uh, lambda here comes at the constant of integration. That's in a simpler way to say, you know, you add something which is constant related to covalent derivative, you have so the so now here, if you want to do anything to lambda you have to physically justify it. it. It is a part of the, what you had first we defined it, it is really characterized as a free space time. And in this equation, it comes on the same footing as the TAB. And so if you want to do this, want to rub it off, then you have to give a justification not for your likes or dislikes. <coughs> you. So you, we got the thing right. Now there is a problem coming, so now let me complete the lambda story so that um, but we over.
So I said after the treatment solution, you had the lemna became sort of dangling in space. Me what? <coughs> In 1967, by then you see the quantum theory, your quantum field theory has come out. And the people in so people like Yelovich uh, said, there are quantum vacuum fluctuations. So matter produces quantum vacuum fluctuations. And that has energy momentum. That must also gravitate. That should also be included. And, uh, and then it turns out that energy momentum of the quantum fluctuations, or what you call the vacuum energy, has the same form as energy. So at one point, you have to immediately say, okay, here I have a physical meaning for lambda. But this excitement was very short-lived because vacuum energy, lambda is a length, to the absolute form that Planck's constant and the Planck's constant from Planck constant also you can construct a length. The Planck length. So you have the Planck length something like this. Now, the moment you, you have these two lengths, you like to compare them. And there came a real talk. So, that the lambda is too small and this is a, such a monstrous number that we could, we cannot. <coughs> then the quantum physicists being more powerful, strong people, uh, carry a lot of cloud with them. So they say no, Planck length is sacred, you can't do it. So again, bit poor lemma with the Planck length. On the other hand, you say, tell me which theory gives me Planck length? Here lemma follows follow a fundamental theory of space time. It's not introduced by hand. It's not constructed. Planck length, on the other hand, I have I I construct by combining three constants. S, G, and C. But no 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 theory of physics gives me Planck. Only justification. Well, you say everything in physics has to have some justification. It may not be very strong, like com coming from a fundamental theory. And that is to say that Compton wavelength becomes the order of the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, 
And you said there are two secret things about two radii you place and you have quantum wavelength or quantum theory. Swarcial radius for here. <coughs> so you would like all length to be larger than the swarcial radius. Because that gives me a uh, horizon. <coughs> and so so here you, and then, so the answer is that at this wavelength, at this length, quantum effects become significant. So you cannot trust classical gravity. So that is the only justification for the Planck length as we construct. Otherwise, it's a construction by combining three things and those three things are again of a varying degree of fundamentalness and that is the C is the most fundamental one there. Because it's a part of space time structure. It's interwoven in the space time structure. Without reference to any dynamics or any force, C is defined as a universal velocity. And for that to universal velocity to exist, we make no reference to any, any physics. <coughs> H is also is a again a universal constant which is true for all. However, it has not yet attained the degree of fundamentalness of C because it has not yet been synthesized in the space-time structure. So H is the uh, universal, but yet not part of space-time structure. <coughs> and to me it is the completion of quantum theory will be when S gets synthesized in the space time so Until then, the quantum theory of which is, when you say quantum theory of space time will include that, that S becomes a part of the space time structure. Also, also space time is so intimately uh, connected to gravity so any theory of quantum gravity ultimate theory of quantum gravity so synthesize as well as this. G on the other hand is the list of uh, fundamental momentum because it refers to a one particular force though it is universal force. So it's a constant of a universal force. <coughs> In contrast, <coughs> lambda, what can you in the, in the same scale of degree of fundamentalness, what can we say about lambda? Lambda, where did you first introduce? It came from the homogeneity of space-time, free space-time definition. So, lambda like C, is a constant of space-time structure. So 
So lambda and C are the two most fundamental constants. Among them, of course, so C and lambda have a are the two constants of space-time structure. They are on the same footing. However, among the two, C has an edge. C has an edge for the reason that <coughs> C I introduce without reference to any force. Lambda also I introduce, but lambda I introduce by asking the geometry of the free space time. But for C, I don't even need to ask. This is a possibility. Other question, other some part of this is this, that in the framework, <coughs> C equal to zero is not admitted. It's meaningless, you can't. Whereas, lambda equal to zero is a solution. I we said the homogeneous space-time is of constant curvature and that, that curvature could be positive, negative, or zero. So, zero value for lambda is included, which is not included for C. So, if you look at these different constants and their, their degree of fundamentalness, nothing can beat C. The, Universal velocity, because that is right there. Then you will have a lambda depending upon what the cosmology tells you. So that's how the your this. Uh, so the so lambda got resurrected in '67, but soon again it was buried. That is no good. See, let us and give you this kind of a, a monstrous number. Then again, so he, you see, the lambda has uh, this uh, uncanny resurrecting cycle of every 30, 40 years. So about 30, 1967 and come 1997. And you have this observation from the supernova where you said against all expectations universe is the expansion is really accelerating rather than decelerating. You wanted <coughs> the presence of matter to arrest the expansion so it should decelerate which is the new view. Excellent. Then, lo and behold, you put in lambda, and that gives you exactly what you want, what the evolution tells you. So as a matter of fact, one big picture should have been, like the universal velocity was got identified with the velocity of light, in the Maxwell theory, which was uh, experimentally observed. Lambda, for the first time, got observationally measured. So, so one right kind of a thing is acceleration of the universe is is the indication of presence of lambda. And it is for the first time lambda being observationally made. All observations 
are brilliantly accounted for by Buddha. But if you accept the simplest of explanations, then most theoretical physicists have nothing to do. We have, we have to keep on doing things. So then we try to invent theories which produce repulsion rather than the attraction <coughs> And of course, we are also very good in inventing very attractive terminology. So what you ask is, so we call this behavior dark energy. So I say the bright energy or non-dark energy attracts things, dark energy repels things. Now, as a matter of fact, just to see, it is it is uh, <coughs> as obnoxious as you could think that you are really trying to and the, when you ask them how do you do this sort of thing you say but you see situation is so desperate we have to explain the uh, and your explanation of the human but you say why not why not get the what's wrong with that Oh, but we don't know where the problem comes. So that is true. We don't know the where the problem comes. So everything I don't still don't know in fifty day from the gun. So we just keep that as an open question that you try to say. But no. So that's uh, uh, <coughs> so you, you you have the dark energy model. And there again I I don't have We have such arbitrariness. You take a scalar field. Scalar field is a freely available mistress character. Then you have a, you can choose any potential you like. And you build up a board. You plot curve and try to keep on fitting the thing. So a dozen new models come out every day. And then you <coughs> we don't stop at this. We even introduce something called phantom field. That is even much more <laughs> glorious in its absurdity. Where these are the fields with kinetic energy is made. Imagine yourself some 50 years back telling your supervisor that I have a solution with the uh, phantom field which has kinetic energy zero he would advise why don't you go to some psych psych psychotherapist but here we are we have all very respected physicists who do again that Justification is only yes. It's a desperate situation which requires desperate cure. How sure meaningless that be? Now, tell me how how are you doing? So we can so it's one and a half hour already. Uh, so yeah. We can so questions. So maybe maybe if somebody wants to. There are some questions, otherwise I get <coughs> one. Or maybe I sit for a while. Yes. yes. Uh, one, <coughs> one question regarding the free space time. So yes. Define it to be homogeneous space time. So you already invoking the some kind of differential structure. Some kind, some kind of, of differential structure because you need to oh, yes. be able to tell if it's 
Så vil jeg ikke sidst til noget, vil jeg ikke spise den meget spise den, og jeg takker den. Og jeg tror, at du finder til sig. Derfor, the solution that the human tender is proposing to run the energy, it's like definition of what the homogeneous structure is. Yes, 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 that's right. So, I think I guess you get what you are driving at, is that In a quantum theory of space-time, where differential structure is at not a priority given to you, this may this could be a question. This may not be right. Right. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. That was mine. Yeah. No, that's very 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 good question. You ought to. We ought always try to very clearly delineate the boundaries of the validity of the statements we make, yes. That, that, that's, that's right. Also, maybe a silly question, because huh? because you said that the, you, your derivation of Einstein equation, yeah. I mean, there are, uh, this is like the simplest possible structure. You just say TAB is energy motion tensor, right? But yeah. you, can, you can also have, like, it would be energy motion tensor, mm -hmm. Plus energy momentum tensor squared or something like that. So you're invoking also some kind of simplicity principle. That is true. Uh, <coughs> okay. So here, what you are saying is that well, uh, how is it? Mm, no. <coughs> Let's keep that thing open. TAB is energy momentum, which may be linear as well as non-linear. I don't care. Right. I mean, TAB could be non-linear in fields or something like that. Oh, TAB could be non-linear in fields. Yeah. But it could be also non-linear in the energy momentum tensor itself. So, but I will call that as a. So, whatever you make, you write TAB. Yeah. You write the AB in a linear form. Right. You write on your and that whether yeah. that is that is my new TAB. Yeah. But you only say when this TAB just measures the inhomogeneity of the space there. Oh no no. Yeah. Sorry. No. No. No, 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 no. So inhomogeneity is measured by any kind of an energy momentum distribution in the space. So the whole point we are saying is we are not talking Energy momentum distribution in any form mm -hmm. is the cause of inhomogeneity. Yeah. Now that energy momentum distribution in what form it is, you understand that. That is up to you. Okay. So, yeah. so, so this so this TAB should include everything. All what you can say, is, yeah. All what you could say is that my Left hand side I have only the linear part, but that is that mm -hmm. Riemann curvature is linear. Right. 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 For that my answer to that is that yes, you could have in principle you could start from okay. so there there are uh, so there what we have uh, is <coughs> Before that, let me tell you, uh, that, that then I come to your question. So, uh, the, uh, my punchline was here, here, which I cannot say. That had Einstein followed this three line derivation of uh, his equation, he would have realized lambda is the true constant of space time structure. He did not have to apologetic about its introduction and then doubly apologetic for uh, uh, throwing it away. But not only that, if that had that been there, and if he realized this thing, 
Früher wurde er in Sphäre of this uh, confusion, which is more than 100 years we are living with, and yet there is no sign of abating it. And this would have been attacked. Now, in this my picture, my bias here, and that's, that's the general thought. You see, this is one way of getting the Einstein equals. <coughs> and my the next claim is, which is sometimes I probably talk, talk to people, is, is I, that a fundamental force is equation of motion so be dictated by the geometry of the corresponding space. The fundamental force, the equation of motion, should not be prescribed. Like classically, Newton prescribed inverse square law. Coulomb prescribed inverse square law. Here you see the inverse square law follows from the space-time geometry. So you should take away from home this is that space-time geometry gives you something very solid which you know of inverse square law. You. But this is the property of the space-time geometry. No, and no prescription. So we have uh, we have no choice of tempering with the law of gravity, is the geometry. Now, in your general thing, what you have, uh, you how do you obtain your uh, in this thing? You do this. Delta R root minus e p four x. Right? You vary the Lagrangian. And for the gravity, when you do, you always do that very funny thing. <coughs> it's not only very realizing this, but in, in a different way you could do. Uh, when you vary, so in general you want the real dynamics is sitting in the second derivative. But in our usual derivation, the second derivative part we throw out writing as a surface term. But my, uh, uh, <coughs> my late friend Arunava uh, had also used that saying, your surface term, you can derive the equation of motion from the surface term. So as a matter of fact, the surface term and non-surface term are complementary to each other. <laughs> you. So, so that's right, you, you derive this. I will instead want to do is that I don't want to use any this general technique. I want to use only the differential geometry with my guy. <coughs> so you have <coughs> now you say okay this one is very fine, but can you hold include the higher order. It's not linear in curvature, but you know. And I said, yes, I can include this. If the higher orders are, are of right kind, or you include them in the right way. And the right way by which I mean that I, you can include the higher orders with uh, <coughs> demanding, so ultimately what uh, uh, demand for uh, any equation of motion is, that equation must be second order. That on the variation, the equation which you get, or from here this equation, the equation you get must be second order. Now, that demand of being second order identifies a particular combination of the higher order terms. And that is called the 
Love, love, holy love. So with this, and that of course again is true, the love of terms, higher order terms, are non trivial only in dimensions greater than four. So if I stick to the four dimensions, then I'm all fine. If I go to the higher dimension, then I said yes, I will go to the higher dimension with the love lock part. And for that, what I have done is I have defined what you could say, let's say, love lock Riemann tensor, which is a homogeneous polynomial in Riemann tensor with, with specific coefficients. So, for example, so the best known to everybody here is the quadratic, the Gauss body. If this is a Gauss body thing, then what you have? You have a Riemann square minus one over four Ricci square plus Ricci square square. Ah, so what did I do? Oh, that, that's what, that's what. Well, uh, this, this is the, sorry, this is the Lagrangian. The one Lagrangian of that, that kind. And then of any order you can do. So we did this exercise, and fortunately it all worked, that, that you can define in the love log and the log of the matrix. But then came a problem. So it took me a couple of years to uh, sort it out. Because to get to this, I want the Bianchi derivative. <coughs> so for the linear order Riemann, Bianchi derivative was identically zero. Of this, your love of Riemann, Bianchi derivative will not be zero. Because the love lock Riemann, I have no corresponding metric. It is only a superstructure. It is defined in terms of the Riemann itself. Connection to the metric, only Riemann has. But its higher powers do not have a direct connection. And so, right, so I have a, so I, I said that, so this, Riemann, I take its Bianchi derivative, okay. Which in general will be non zero. No power. So that's something which stuck. Then on some days after a couple of years of thinking or uh, prodding over it, one suddenly realized. To get to here, you do not really need this. You need its trace to be zero. So take that trace of this. So then you demand this. That I don't care what I say this. This is zero. And this demand then fix in the coefficients you have for this polynomial, like your, that this should be one, this should be minus one by four, this should be one. So you have a pure love lock thing. And so the same procedure could, will go through or all, uh, any order of love lock. So that's the, uh, <clears throat> so that's how the, the story gets completed. But of course, if you say, no, I don't care for the second order equation, then you don't care for uh, un undesirable things like ghost things sitting around. So, however, the, I, 
to the soul. With this, Lavlov had this one problem that that Lavlok Rima curvature does not have a direct connection to the metric as the linear Riemann has. The linear Riemann is the derivative comes from the connection. Right? So even if that, uh, I'm happy that suppose you don't go to the metric, but after I even but I don't know. I can't even define a connection which will generate a little, so say Gosborn is just to be specific, quadratic, quadratic rim. And it's not being directly related to the metric, has its own problems, like if you want to uh, set in the inertia rim problems. So yeah, 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 so here we have a ticklish problem. Though the equation is second order, Yet, I, I have difficulty in right, uh, prescribing the proper initial conditions. Because the initial conditions only are in terms of the metric. And that metric doesn't have a direct connection to the demand, but it has a, only through, through, the, through the linear demand. So there is something dang dangling there, but there are some, some other very interesting things which you can do about what you call a, a pure law lock, where you take only one term of this, but that I should talk on some other day. Okay. So, any other questions? If not, let's say finish.